<clears throat> Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to, to the first Sphere Lab. This um, lab uh, theme, this is the first of a series of lab that will be ongoing in the next uh, three years. So the title of this first lab is Reimagining Art and Value Flows, The Sphere as Digital Commons. We have a wonderful mix of presentations, discussions, and even circus performances. Jay here, uh, coming up, and everything will be accessible online. So let me very briefly introduce the sphere. Inspired by the recent innovations in the field of distributed ledger technologies, or blockchain, and peer-to-peer -peer contributive economies, the Sphere is a radically innovative peer-to-peer -peer community platform for self-organization and sustainable cooperation in circus and the, perf uh, the performing arts. It allows for different actors of the performing art ecosystem, artists, cultural professionals, audience, cultural organizations, and a wide range of sympathizers and other stakeholders to initiate creative collaborations and implement new funding strategies. So let me describe the Sphere digital infrastructure briefly. Um, it is uh, designed to foster a safe, cooperative, and value-generative environment for its participants. And it's composed of four interrelated layers. First, the Anarchive, a dynamic process-oriented archive of artistic works that operates as a digital common repository for artistic knowledge and practice. Second layer is a smart contracts for right management and contributive commons license. Third layer is a contributive accounting system to facilitate collaboration within decentralized open value networks. And the fourth layer is a crypto economic interface enabling uh, liquid ownership and the dynamic governance structures adapted to the coming economy. So each development layer is the occasion for radically innovative and transdisciplinary research creation processes that will unfold over a series of collaborative events and workshops over the next three years. And today, this is the first lab of the Contributive Economies series. And we are delighted to have with us Geert Lovink and Ella Kagel to open up perspectives about commons-oriented economies, and also discuss the history, background, and future of the Money Lab network. So we'll start with Geert. Uh, let me introduce Geert uh, briefly. Uh, he's a media theorist and activist, and also a prolific and inspired uh, essayist. Among his latest publications, we find Social Media Abyss, 2016, Organization After Social Media, 2018, uh, written, co-written with uh, Ned Rossiter, and his latest book is Sad by Design, 2019. He's the founding director of the Institute of Network Cultures in Amsterdam, which is at the origin of the Money Lab, a network of artists, activists, and geek experimenting with forms of financial democratization and considers interventions in and experiments with digital economy. And we're like, at this year, we're a big fan of uh, Geert's work. And uh, we have, uh, created this wonderful sweatshirt um, that I think yet you have a, a copy yeah, of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was wearing it last week, walking around here. Uh, so I'm showing it off. Voila, voila, yeah. voila. Uh, <laughs> I would say it was just uh, interesting because inside by design, it's just a, a paragraph or a little sentence that is, uh, do not yes. feed the platforms t-shirt. And then I was uh, looking. Yeah. So much for this, but it issue. didn't exist. <laughs> Anywhere, so I had to kind of. Uh, so now it exists. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, that's the art of becoming, right? I mean, that's what we're practicing here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much for the uh, invitation. Um, it's always good to go back to the foundations of um, the things that we do. And I think this is what um, you know is our task at the Institute of Network Cultures and uh, also in the um, the networks that we build and maintain and try to grow. Um, Money Lab uh, is a is a network that started in 2013, but obviously has a quite a long prehistory. Uh, because the, the question of uh, how 
uh, let's say money finance uh, income is related to the internet digitization and uh, the whole media question and um, art practices in in particular is of course uh, one that uh, you know is has been with us for for decades now and um, <clears throat> In the first decades, I, I think uh, the whole, uh, what we call culture of the free has been established. If you read uh, Shushana Zuboff's uh, surveillance capitalism, you will get an understanding of, uh, of, of the, the vastness and uh, the secrecy, also the, the kind of the logic of extraction that uh, defines our field at the moment which uh you know i call uh, a social contract uh, you know very much uh, let's say you know in an Hobbesian way uh <clears throat> it is uh, not voluntary but the social contract is not, never voluntary of course uh, and it's very simple people understand it uh very well um we get the services for free and in exchange we give uh, away our data this is the social contract and this has been defining uh you know most of our communication but also a lot of other services um and this extraction then happens in um you know a black box so we yeah we can't really guess what really what's going on it's not transparent hmm? So this is uh, this is another problem. Even if we would be in favor of the extraction, and in favor of giving away our data, uh, this ha happens in a in a complete um, you know obscure uh, way. Uh, and uh, on top of that, in a neoliberal uh, setting of financialization, this also is one of the major uh, motors of the growing uh, global inequality. Right, so th this model is precisely generating all the billionaires. Right, so th the model uh, is quite uh, quite crucial in that sense. We can uh, read, uh, you know, Piketty about that, and this gives a good background. But uh, when we're talking about digitization and the internet, I think uh, it's also good to um, keep in mind. In the past, maybe we were a little bit modest and said, oh, we're only dealing with media and communication. Don't look at us. It's only the internet. You know, it doesn't really matter. But, uh, you know, 20, 30 years later, it's not quite like that anymore. Um, this infrastructure and this logic uh, with which it was built, uh, which produced uh, this uh, platform capitalism, has now entered you know all uh, sectors in society and th this is difficult for us now to understand you know the vastness of it the way for instance you know uh, that's always startling to me uh, how it uh, penetrates for instance uh, agriculture healthcare uh, logistics you know fields that i know very very little of but but the impact is very very large right so so this is a problem, uh, especially when you're coming from, let's say, a media or art background, right? Because we are a sector ourselves, right, as well. Hmm? We do not only build these structures and conceptualize them, dream them up, talk about their, their aesthetics. Huh? Uh, we also work in a field ourselves. And Money Lab is kind of going between these two things right on the one hand we know that when we're talking about money financialization this affects everybody at the same time uh, we're also uh, very much focused uh, on our on building and maybe even defending uh, our own um, ecosystem right which on the one hand may be a startup ecosystem for others you know, it's academic research for others. It's cultural funding and the arts, right? This is all um, 
of course, uh, different for each and every one of us. And, uh, and maybe we are even, you know, changing sides sometimes. Uh, so <clears throat> we're talking here about a very multidisciplinary uh, approach. Okay, uh, so um, yeah, where to start, always difficult, but I think many would agree for, for us, for our biographies, the, the financial crisis in 2008 and, it, and its uh, implications is really a starting point, right? And after that, of course, a few months later, uh, we see uh, the announcement of, uh, of Bitcoin. Uh, so these two things, you know, almost literally um, kind of come together uh, in time. Um, talking about the INC and the <laughs> development of the internet, uh, of course, things were upholded, if you like, a little bit uh, because of the political upheavals uh, that uh, were created and were happening at the time. And here I'm talking about the year of 2011, with the Arab Spring, all the uprisings, and of course, last but not least, Occupy. Right? Occupy uh, has defined uh, the agenda that we're talking about here. Uh, in, in not maybe so much in a money lab sense. I think uh, Occupy was more um, a reflection on what happened in the past 20 years of globalization, financialization, and especially the rise of debt. Yeah? The, the debt crisis uh, in the aftermath of 2008 uh, has really defined um, uh, you know, the world and has, uh, has led to an incredible uh, decline of economic wealth and prosperity, especially in the United States, of course, but hmm, in many, many other countries. So, um, so straight after, let's say, the, the question uh, had arisen of um, social media and activism in 2011, the questions of organization, we moved on to the question of, uh, uh, you know, of money, money, uh, I would say money uh, as such. And this is exciting uh, because very soon in, in 11 and 12, first with WikiLeaks and Assange using Bitcoin. And then soon after we discovered, you know, that um, uh, the, the question of who defines money is up for grabs. And until very recently, uh, until the, in, even in the 90s and, and in the 2000s, uh, we kind of were sensing that this was coming, but uh, it's only in the past 10 years that it's very clear that uh, let's say the, the financial elites, the banks, but especially the <clears throat> Uh, let's say the treasuries and um, uh, ministries of finance have lost and maybe deliberately or not, this is what we can discuss, have lost their monopoly on the definition of money. And so we see there uh, two things coming together. We see uh, the, uh, on the one hand th that this definition of money and the monopoly of money uh, is slowly but steadily eroding. I'm not saying it's completely gone uh, because it's a battle. It's a battle that's, that's going on uh, everywhere uh, around the globe, <clears throat> you know. Um, but okay, so the, the, let's say the, the, the grip on the definition of money through digitization is lost. And so this is then opening a whole field. And I would say this field that is opening up, this is where Money Lab steps in. Um, so, and, and many, many other initiatives, of course. And we are an initiative that uh, net builds a network, but um, yeah, we consist of course of a, a, a multitude of uh, smaller and bigger a more or less successful attempts to, uh, as Eric already said, to democratize the definition of money hmm? 
or de to democratize finance, right? Now, this is, um, of course, not uh, the case for, uh, for everyone. And um, this is what we very soon uh, discovered uh, with, with Manila. And uh, what we try to do with a critical agenda, in which we bring together both activists, geeks, designers, uh, and, and theorists, is that, you know, that this digital money thing is a two-edged sword. On the one hand, we want to design, we want to create, we have certain values, and we want to shape this field, right? I think that's also why we are together here in this meeting. On, uh, but also, we understand that this uh, field that is unfolding, and the rise of digital money, is not happening in a vacuum. So we need, we need to understand we are actors ourselves, eh? no, ma no matter how small we are, but at the same time, we understand that there is an ideological climate in which this is happening, right? And we know, you know, if you look at the past 10 years, roughly speaking, we can look back, that this is an era uh, that is defined by, first and foremost, by regression. Regression means that a lot of things are either declining, coming to a halt, uh, are closing down, are fencing off, and so, et cetera, right? This is not the era of globalization. This is not an era uh, necessarily of, uh, of huge fights also. Huh? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an era in which we see a lot of uh, kind of retreat. Uh, and of this expresses itself, of course, in multiple ways, in, in forms of nationalism, in geopolitics. Uh, huh? When we define the money field now, we would uh, immediately say, you know, there are, you can't talk about money in, in general anymore. Uh, we need to talk about uh, the American system, the European system, if it exists, huh? and China, for instance. Huh? So this is, this is uh, the rise of, geo, of geopolitics. Uh, but also, of course, within the, the, the former West, let's, uh, let's say, to use that term, um, we see the rise of, um, you know, right-wing populism, um, um, of course, racism, uh, sexism. You know, we see, we see really, really strong uh, tendencies and it's maybe, maybe it's even naive now to, define these things as you know going back or retrograde maybe you know sexism and racism is the future right this is the problem right huh? so maybe that's our future huh? we don't want that huh? uh, but okay you know we're here uh, on this election day so <laughs> it is quite an important uh, day so uh, you know let's see uh, you know what um, what's going to happen we will maybe know in a day or a couple of days what the outcome will be but um, a lot of that is also you know who's uh, who has the de definition again who has the power of the definition to this to decide uh, what the future is and um, in this uh, definition the, the the ones that uh, can uh, redesign reshape uh, financial uh, flows, you know, uh, really is in, in an incredible power. Okay, so we, are, we, are, we all uh, agree with that. We are not um, a kind of, uh, you know, very marginal uh, players here. We're uh, really uh, doing important and strategic work uh, here. And time and again, uh, you know, this is uh, the case. Uh, and this also comes, you know, with a responsibility of course, right? So we can speculate whatever we want about, the, the, uh, about all the, the latest, um, you know, uh, gadgets or, or um, you know, software features or um, new fashions, uh, decentralized finance or tokens or, you know, uh, all these things, of course, come and go. But uh, we also need to understand that we are here at the core, let's say, of concept development. Yeah? 
and this is our responsibility right that we are not working in a vacuum ourselves we understand that uh, the creation of digital money uh, you know is happening in a in a almost reactionary and very conservative and troublesome time right and and that uh, it is our task to um, yeah, to f come together this is why the network is uh, so important uh, to exchange um, ideas and also to maybe you know even to a certain point deconstruct uh, together in a collaborative fashion our own desires and uh, pitfalls and um, yeah so this is a this is an, uh, an important part of the money lab network that we're doing critical work uh, and in, with critical work we also mean self-critical uh, why not why not uh, you know discuss each each other's uh, premises or uh, desires for that for that matter right mm -hmm. and uh, in the startup world of course this is not uh, not uh, done right you're not discussing your, uh, your the concept of your of your company with others right and so this is also why we um, we agree don't don't necessarily agree uh, with um, with that type of uh, enterprise right um, there there are a lot of uh, problems uh, uh, attached uh, to that um, I don't want to, you know, go too deeply here into the right-wing, uh, let's say, fundamentals of uh, Bitcoin, blockchain, and uh, you know, others uh, have done that uh, and have um, proven that uh, this is these are not just private, uh, let's say, uh, belief systems of uh, a lot of these uh, white male um, geek. Uh, developers and uh, entrepreneurs, uh, but that that but that in the meanwhile, uh, these uh, dangerous ideologies have, so to say, condensated uh, into code, or condensated into architectures, right? And I think this is uh, what we uh, we're trying to do. We're trying to understand, uh, you know, a little bit what's what's going on there, even though. Uh, a lot of that is sometimes already, you know, happening on the black box level. So uh, we are, that's why in the Money Lab network, we have, you know, a considerable part of us are doing, let's say, the work of WikiLeaks or investigative journalism, right? Um, um, the world of finance is, uh, you know, is secretive and uh, opaque to say the the least and um, this is also why uh, you know in that decade the money lab decade uh, you know we have seen uh, uh, huge scandals uh, such as the, the Panama Papers and so on and so on right and um, almost every week I'm spending a little bit of my time working precisely uh, on uh, on that uh, question just to give you an example um, only last week and I found out too late, uh, even two Bitcoin uh, traders in the Netherlands were convicted because uh, they were uh, hiding and uh, um, uh, obscuring um, 200 million uh, euros uh, in, in Bitcoin. Um, and, you know, this is very weird because, um, yeah, from the beginning, the Money Lab has looked into this you know, what I sometimes uh, ironically call, you know, the criminal energy in our scene, right? And in the Netherlands here, yeah, we, are, we are very familiar with what, what that means. What that means when, you know, your own scene has this kind of vital criminal energy, right? Uh, we're talking here about, of course, the, the, the trade in, uh, in hashish and marijuana. Uh, but um, uh, you know the, the, the as a tax haven, Netherlands um, is, has also a lot of uh, other uh, examples of uh, this criminal energy, and we know these people. You know they're even part uh, of us, so we should not uh, be uh, be surprised there. And imagine how tempting it is if you can invent money, yeah. 
yeah, what it what the what the, the incredible potential that has uh, also just for your libido for your self understanding right uh, we've seen people really going going crazy if you if you can create gold out of nothing if yeah? and the, the famous bitcoin history book is called digital gold right we can create gold out of nothing that's that's pure magic that's uh, alchemy right alchemy come true by the way right so it's n it's not just um, some kind of uh, trick but um, uh, these things have uh, very very real uh, implications okay now uh, I want to close with maybe a little bit of an overview of the different topics that we've covered and still covering uh, in Money Lab, because uh, it's that this diversity, let's say, that uh, you know also makes it possible for even uh, you know for people who work in circus, which uh, you know I, I really uh, respect, and uh, I think this is a, a very very good uh, uh, you know case study, um, if you like, um, where we can uh, look at uh, you know how uh, digital technologies can uh, reshape social relationships can reshape let's say revenue uh, models but most of all i think and this is what uh, a lot of people in money lab uh, network share is that we uh, take control of uh, of the technical means uh, to redistribution wealth and value or value and wealth depending on <laughs> which comes uh, first right so, so that there is the, the, a strong idea in a lot of the projects that uh, you know there is a social justice element there, and that money is a is a deeply uh, social uh, uh, relationship, right? And this goes back already, you know, to the 18th and 19th century huh? um, when when this was uh, was discovered, and um, you know, in the whole. Uh, classic uh, political economy of uh, Marx, but uh, and everything that come, came later, uh, this is the, the idea. So, uh, so we can use all these tools uh, to in fact renegotiate or, or yeah, redefine uh, how to redistribute uh, the, the wealth and uh, maybe also knowledge, wisdom you know it doesn't always have to be purely uh, about um, let's say ledger systems you know that uh, that share other values right and this is the good thing about this these technologies that uh, they can even go beyond let's say um, money and uh, remuneration mm -hmm. Okay, uh, back in the, let's say 13, 14, when we started, of course, the, you know, the, the whole idea of blockchain, Bitcoin, uh, Ethereum um, was um, uh, exciting. Vitali, the, the uh, inventor of, um, um, of the Ethereum was, um, was at the first Money Lab event just uh, as somebody who was <laughs> visiting i had no idea i i found out much later uh so he wasn't even a speaker uh, at the time um so um we were we discussing there for instance uh you know the question of uh of crowdfunding and we we still believe that uh, crowdfunding is a uh, is kind of like an ur form you know it's like okay, I generate things uh, for you because I support your case. And in the arts and culture context, this is really still important, right? Um, of course, there is a strong wish somehow to automate uh, revenue models, right? And this is, a, this is an, an almost uh, still utopian promise, uh, but we know that it's uh, f uh, far away still, right? So there are short term goals that we need to uh, get and uh, these goals are you know that you and i and, and many of us especially our friends the people we work with can have a living wage can have some form of i don't know 
Uh, we can then start to discuss uh, how to call it. Should it be a universal basic income? Should it be, uh, you know, uh, should it be in part coming from somewhere else and in part earned, uh, you know, privately? Uh, or should it uh, be redistributed uh, in forms of uh, co cooperative forms, right? This is, of course, uh, very much also depending on whether you work on your own uh, at home or if you are in a, in a group or uh, or in a, you know in a much larger context in which uh, let's say new forms uh, of trade unions uh, can come up to to negotiate um, uh, how people um, can uh, yeah make uh, make a living out of the work uh, that uh, they are doing. Okay. Um, we are inspired, of course, in the beginning uh, by mobile money in Africa. This was a very important starting point. And with that, of course, also comes the examples of uh, how uh, this digitization uh, works out uh, in a country like China. Uh, if we look at Alipay, WeChat, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, so um, really already advanced payment systems uh, that uh, make it possible for large groups or in society uh, to make a, make a living. And this is important uh, because we're still, again, we're talking about digital technologies that inherently have it in them that everything is shared for free, uh, right? And this definitely works against everybody who is trying to make a living, right? So, so there is this huge uh, attempt uh, going on everywhere, everywhere you go, um, to uh, somehow uh, row against uh, the stream and um, against the stream of the uh, of the free to uh, to create a living and um, uh, Substrack uh, and uh, pa Patreon are are now uh, you know uh, quite uh, established um, uh, platforms and uh, we've been uh, following them from the very start and uh, we would uh, like to see you know, a much, much more a broadening uh, of these uh, systems. Remember in the, in the past, people would say, Netflix will never ever work, never, because people are refusing to pay for content, right? This was always the idea of Silicon Valley. They, should, they, they have tried for 10 years to stop uh, you know, uh, Netflix and other uh, systems because they said people uh, refuse uh, to pay for subscriptions and that will never work, huh? right? So this lobby of the free is still very strong, but uh, they're losing ground everywhere, right? And so this is very interesting. The more, let's say, particularly Facebook uh, and uh, uh, Google come uh, under pressure, the better it is for us and the better it is in general for the millions and millions uh, of, uh, of content creators uh, around uh, the globe. However, these ideologies and systems are very strong. And um, again, on this election day, let's, uh, let's see how things uh, work out, right? So uh, even there we can see that uh, the American elections are playing an, an important role uh, in, uh, in all this. And um, okay. Um, of course, the work of artists, and I want to mention that here, uh, is, an, is a topic in itself that for Money Lab is very, very important. Uh, I'm mentioning here, the, for instance, the, the latest book, or not the latest, but the one before by Max Haven, uh, Art uh, uh, After Money, Money After Art, uh, in which he describes and also historicizes a little bit, you know, how artists uh, throughout the decades um, have looked, have envisioned, uh, you know, what, uh, what money um, is about. And of course there you, you can, uh, you, sh you should not only think about, okay, you know, that uh, a painting, let's say, um, uh, you know, a Rembrandt painting would, uh, would go for 80 million or something like that. There is that uh, element uh, for sure. Uh, you know, of the, of the gallery and the auction house uh, world. But um, we are more interested in, uh, you know, how uh, contemporary artists working right now um, are dealing uh, 
uh, with with this. Um, then um, uh, I mentioned it uh, uh, earlier. Um, we have um, also put in a lot of effort to work together with, uh, let's say, more the designers, people who visualize financial flows. Because a lot of this, and this is what uh, is often quite difficult for, for people who are not busy with this, money and these systems are extremely abstract, right? And that this is, of course, uh, you know, inherent to the topic itself. So our task is also to visualize what's going on. And in, in that process of visualization, uh, let's say the artistic imagination is playing a very, very important role. So if we want to, you know, discuss this, experiment with this, the, the ultimately the, the element of aesthetics uh, will, uh, will come on the table rather sooner than, than later, right? In the, in, when we're talking about uh, just uh, the, the startups, of course, they're the first thing they are confronted with uh, is uh, let's say interface design hmm, of their apps and so on and so on, right? So you you, you build something and immediately uh, you're uh, confronted with this uh, question of aesthetics. Um, this is not something, of course, that in the world of geeks and finance is playing an important role. But if you look at the uh, let's say the current uh, system. Um, uh, of uh, startup and apps, of course, uh, you know, in, let's say, um, uh, these, this visualization be, is becoming uh, important. And of course, this is the age of big data. So uh, everything is creating an incredible amount of data, even our own uh, initiatives. And uh, this uh, is something uh, we want to deal with. And so um, together with investigative journalists uh, and designers, MoneyLab has always uh, somehow uh, looked at that question of um, how do we, you know, make it, make it visible. Uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, yes, in, the, in the sense also that, uh, you know, Bruno Latour talks about it, namely making things visible. In, in that sense, that, that, that's, that we can see that as a, almost a metaphorical or metaphysical act. Namely, we bring the things that are not known into the public, right? But we, we know these days that uh, this act uh, uh, is very, very important that making things visible uh, also has a very strong element in it of aesthetics. Hmm? How do you visualize what you what we're talking about here? And uh, this is uh, where uh, artists are playing uh, an important uh, role uh, here. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I want to leave it uh, here, and maybe we can uh, discuss it. And for sure, uh, Ella will, uh, you know, uh, continue uh, with this. I'm very proud that she is a, a member of the Money Lab board. And uh, we have a, a money lab uh, in Berlin uh, coming coming up in, in March that she and uh, her group and many people around it at the supermarket is organizing. So I'm, I'm very happy to be here uh, with her. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Gert. I think you will have to leave pretty soon. So I think the best way uh, for now would be to maybe react directly on your talk and then uh, Ella will, will follow. Uh, maybe I can go first with a quick question because I, I, um, I really like the way that there is a tension that goes through uh, everything you're, you're talking about. This kind of tension between on the one hand this um, urge or this necessity to make things public, to make things visible on the one hand, and then this kind of uh, autonomous spirit, you know, to also, um, like you're addressing the problem of the fragmentation of the social. And when we talk about money uh, and, and the necessity to create new networks for, for value to circulate differently, there's this type of, uh, of tension between, on the one hand, the publicness, uh, that needs to be revealed and then on the other side like where are these initiatives coming from where 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 do we start like how do we constitute ourselves as as uh, 
uh, strong enough nodes in order to contest the, the, the power to design money flows. And you're referring to this uh, criminal energy that, that flows through uh, the, the, the design of, of new uh, money instrument. And, mm -hmm. and maybe I, I could quote you here uh, from organization after social media. You have this passage that I love, really provocative, that for me articulates this tension between the necessity to make things visible and public on the one hand, but also the necessity to, to, to reinforce local initiatives, you know, to, yeah. to not necessarily abide by the, the standards of publicness. So you write, the mass introduction of cryptography is a reassessment of the secret society as a cultural technique. Invisible and secret organizations have been accused of the terror of the informal, which is reprimanded for not being accountable. This politically correct rhetoric needs to be countered with the argument that organized networks are not public organizations or state bodies. So yes. this, I see a distinction here between maybe what you call like networks versus platform, but like this, this uh, yep. difficult uh, uh, problematization of, of what a network is uh, in relation to publicness uh, more generally. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, it's a very interesting uh, tension that is out there. Um, it's, I would say it's the tension between um, finding basic forms of organization to, uh, let's say, kick off a certain process. And we know that, um, and this is the, the problem, for instance, for today's society, especially for the millennials, already a little bit less so for Generation Z that comes uh, after them, but especially the millennials uh, are struggling massively uh, with this problem that uh, you know they are out there in the open and they they can't really uh, s s come together in secret because uh, they they have no idea uh, how to do that right their whole life is or or organized uh, on these social media platforms and the only way to uh, organize themselves is through uh, these, uh, these platforms, right? And so uh, if we want to, let's say, kick off new uh, initiatives, we will have to understand that, you know, we have to come together uh, and build up trust, um, meet and uh, be excited about the, the energy that uh, is unleashed, uh, you know, when you meet someone else and, you know, start to collaborate and uh, start to make big plans. We all know, uh, you know, this initial phase of excitement, which is uh, uh, really, uh, but that, uh, you know, cannot really happen out uh, in the open uh, on, on, uh, on platforms uh, in which uh, you know everyone else, uh, also your family and friends and whoever you ever worked with, uh, can just uh, follow you uh, what you're doing. So it's the question really of the birth of the new, right? How do things, new things, come into being? And so it is perhaps less related. To this desire, to the very German desire, uh, to uh, have secrecy and privacy, and uh, uh, to have this, to build this shield, uh, this uh, cryptographic shield against uh, the all-seeing eye of the Brick Brother State, right? Um, it, although you know, in some countries, of course, uh, uh, and some countries with a history like Germany, this is uh, perfectly understandable why people uh, would do that. Uh, this is not uh, necessarily, uh, you know, the, the overall aim of uh, what a lot of people are trying to uh, achieve. I would emphasize there that this uh, relative um, invisibility is, is a pure necessity uh, if we want to create something new. Thanks, Geert. That's uh, super inspiring. Uh, maybe we can open up to the room and, and then to online questions. I don't know how you're feeling here. Uh, 
otherwise we'll yeah. Yeah, but I, I'm thinking, uh, I have a question, or I guess it's a reflection, I would say, uh, mm -hmm. thinking about the, the sphere in particular, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, we, are, we are having this kind of uh, uh, vision or idea of, of uh, sharing, like a lot being for the artists in the community of the sphere to be able to share like the secret source of, of their uh, um, production work, how the, their pro artistic processes and so on, and rely on a kind of uh, network like the Sphere to to put in uh, somehow digitize uh, uh, what is normally very informal. Like uh, how how did we come to this uh, performance, and then let other artists go into that process and kind of remix and reshape and and work from like an op open source kind of spirit work from parts of the artistic process of, of others, just be allowed to do that. And then, uh, uh, and then put, the, put their uh, uh, versions uh, out in the world. And, and what, what has made this like uh, vision possible, I think for me has been um, that, that there's some kind of secure uh, hidden, what we have called the digital soul stolen from Primavera de Felipe's uh, uh, plantoid, which they talk about the digital soul. And uh, this, uh, we want to open up, but then we, we are creating another uh, informal right away that is uh, uh, infected or like will we'll kind of change the way how we, how we now socialize, socialize around our artistic work uh, and produce. Uh, what I'm thinking about here is like the, this, the values, uh, the circus uh, production process values, for instance, how to kind of um, capture them in new ways and let them free for others to, to take part of them. This is, this is really a kind of, um, in one way, it's like people are actually saying, so how can I know, how can I just let go of, of uh, my, my process, of my, my uh, uh, production of my way of making art and, and I will not be it will not be mine anymore and the more I've been working with this weird the more I've been starting to think that anyway what you have created is is yours so how can we let um, this is just a, this is a, a shift in my mind in my I think my reflection when I boil it down now because I always speak like this because I try to like find where I'm going but uh, it's, it's actually uh, how um, how can we um, Oh, this is so complex anyway, but how, how can we trust and allow this to happen uh, just because of new, new IP management or whatever combined with some kind of blockchain mm -hmm. uh, solution? Uh, do, do you, when you listen to this, like, do you see uh, uh, what are the potential issues that you, that you think about and what are like, uh, what makes sense to you? Because I, I would, I'm quite interested uh, to hear your uh, point of view on something like the sphere, for, actually. Oh, um, yeah, I come from, I think, a, a generation that uh, grew up with the bankruptcy, the moral bankruptcy of, uh, of the copyright system. Um, so n not only, you know, just in financial sense, but uh, especially uh, the legitimacy uh, of it that uh, has uh, uh, completely uh, been uh, eroded because uh, it was proven time and again already in 80s, 90s uh, and so on uh, that uh, the copyright was going to a very small uh, group of people and um, so it was not a redistribution of uh, wealth, talent and uh, you know at all. Hmm? It was not reaching uh, the uh, the artists themselves, and this is of course the main reason why we uh, still, uh, you know, uh, absolutely subscribe to the peer-to-peer -peer logic, uh, to the blockchain, blockchain uh, uh, you know, mechanisms, um, uh, to the automated ledger systems, because uh, um, even though it creates a new class of intermediates, of course we know that. Huh? We cannot be uh, naive about that, but at least also it, uh, you know, 
to, to put it in a, in a McLuhan way, you know, you get something rid of the old and get something back from the new. Uh, we also create, uh, you know, new forms of, uh, of redistribution. Or let's say, for, uh, not even redistribution, a fair distribution that was intended in the first place, right? Uh, imagine uh, if... Uh, People who purchase something or go somewhere can pay artists directly, right? This is still a dream. This is still a complete utopia for the 21st or 22nd century, you know, without intermediates. Huh? But if I, if I like a song and listen to it, huh, uh, mm, I pay something, you know, not, not to a record company, but or to a, 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 a rights agency, but to the artist, right? Uh, why not? Well, technically, it's possible. We know that, right? There are no technical obstacles for that, but an enormous amount uh, of, uh, of so obstacles in society. Uh, and um, uh, on the other hand, also, um, you know, uh, we need to think of a system, I would say, in which those automated payment systems are supplement to the basic income right because otherwise if yeah if it, 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 it will only be something like a, a law of the jungle huh? uh, if um, uh, you know certain people uh, it will create uh, enormous uh, gaps of inequality um, uh, again so um, we need to kind of politicize this 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 level but having said that you know to be able to pay someone directly i would love to do that for sure can i just one reflect right away it says how to pay a milieu or how to pay a community so let's say uh and it's, you are listening to that uh, artist music that the artist is also part of uh, uh uh, something like this here and we, where the profit towards that artist will be distributed to the to that community to create more uh, artistic work from from the milieu itself that would be another way of, of maybe um, redistributing also that inequality uh, that could happen uh, if, if uh, yeah if profit would go straight to the artist uh, because then you can also say we are all influenced by what we're doing here uh, in different ways uh, where and uh, therefore uh, what comes in will go to the community in different ways that feels that according to protocol or whatever of course but uh, uh, yeah, that's a reflection right away that uh, would be interesting to or, or i'm thinking a lot about mm -hmm. at the moment you know, I just I think this is a good example of also of the complexity of the very simple question: How can I give money to the, to the to this song, basically? Mm -hmm. Because just like I come from the music industry, uh, just like a circus, uh, music is a group effort. If you hear a song, uh, if maybe you have, maybe two hundred people contributed in some way to producing this song and placing it in the, your loudspeakers. And uh, the group itself may be 10 people, there may be 10 writers. If you listen to Max Martin's songs, there are at least 10 writers. And, uh, and there are publishers and the studios and the, the, all the other layers of people who contribute. Like, just like in the circus performance, you have a bunch of people on stage and then you have a bunch of people off stage. So, who is the artist that should receive this? And not everyone contributed equally much. They did a lot of different things. It's, uh, it's not that easy just to have, if, if, if I write a song and sing it uh, straight away on the, on the internet, then it's sort of easier. But it's also a mix of, because the service company probably had a mix of private and public money that contributed to creating this, uh, just as any music uh, venue would have. So it's um, it's not just uh, it it would it would be great if you just 
give money and it goes straight to the to the just uh, division of people. Yeah. I think we go to what Eric was talking about, where there's this friction between um, formalization and uh, um, obscurity, where I think if you, you have a great understanding of who contributed what, exactly how, sort of in the current system, you know, like you have segmentation of uh, artistic labor and, you know, a singer or whoever is in the spotlight gets emphasized a lot and, uh, you know, all the others are sort of like artistic laborers or whatever, so like you immediately have this uh, division. And I think maybe putting a layer where everything is produced uh, in an obscure way where, where contributions are not necessarily immediately readable, I think that gives sort of comes closer to the commons idea where uh, you know, they make uh, livelihoods as a collective rather than you know, like, oh, this is exactly how you contributed, you should get that. Mm -hmm. But there is the, that friction, there's still, you know, the free rider problem is still there, and you know. Just, just an example. Just yeah, one second, just yeah. uh, because mm -hmm. it's 11 uh, right now, and uh, I think Gert has to leave perhaps, right? Yeah. So, so we will uh, take, let's say, 10 minutes break. Just uh, we haven't yet met the people here in the room, and it would be nice to touch base. And uh, for people online, I, I like in, we'll be back in what 10 minutes. Uh, with uh, Ella's presentation, and we will keep on discussing, but we want we don't want to keep uh, Geert uh, any longer. Mm -hmm. So uh, Geert, really, really, it's always always a pleasure to discuss with you, and I, I really hope we're going to have a chance to discuss further uh, sooner than later. Maybe hopefully. in Berlin for sure. Berlin in person. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Fantastic. Uh, it's, it's a hard. pity. It's a pity we didn't get to talk. But yeah, I'll, I'll get back to you next week. I have some updates. <laughs> yeah, good. Wonderful. Okay. You see? And uh, there's always the province. Remember, you know, we'll meet in Berlin uh, at the next <laughs> okay. Manila. Okay. This yeah, is okay. what will uh, keep me alive during the long, uh, dark winter. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Lovely. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. So we'll follow up with uh, our second speaker. Ella Kagel. Um, yes, I will introduce Ella. Uh, she's a digital strategist operating at the intersection of society, technology, and economy. Central to Ella's practice is supporting bottom up initiatives deeply rooted in particular communities of practice. And that's something that I really appreciate about your work, Ella. Like it is a, a real deep commitment to communities. In 2010, Ella co-founded Supermarkt, an independent hub for digital culture and collaborative economy. And Supermarkt uh, will be uh, an important partner for the Sphere, uh, the Sphere's operation uh, in Berlin. And it's great also that we have uh, Yael online. You can't maybe see her, but she's there. So with Yael, we've worked hard with Ella to create uh, a partnership for the coming labs uh, that will be happening in, in Berlin. And as Git was mentioning, the next Money Lab <coughs> conference will be happening uh, in Berlin. Ella is the main organizer, and that's going to be uh, um, late March 2021. So Ella, it's really a pleasure to, to have you here. Uh, and uh, the, floor is, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Eric, for the invitation. Hi, everybody. Hi, Ole. Hi, Yael. So these are the people I've met before, at least. Thank you for bringing this together. And hi, everybody else who is in the room or listening remotely. So I'm calling in from Berlin, uh, Kreuzberg. Um, and um, I'm here at Supermarkt. <clears throat> and before uh, I dive a little bit deeper into um, into Money Lab and why why is important, you know, its importance for me and my work. I also want to take a, a small step back into history, inspired by Gerd, because mm -hmm. he gave this really nice overview, and I just feel like I want to enforce some of the things he have already been addressing. So, I uh, just want to talk about two formative moments that led me to doing the work I do today. So. 
first moment is back in 1996 when I was in art school in Amsterdam. So I'm trained as an artist, but I started working in the field of economy and um, digital technologies um, almost 25 years ago. And the reason why I made this shift from the arts towards a little bit more towards the economy is, uh, is, is basically is this book I was given. It's called The Case Against the Global Economy. It dates back, I'm just writing down the title in the chat. So it dates back to 1996, um, so 24 years old. And it was really interesting because it was, uh, it was just when I started my master, my, my master um, education at art school in Amsterdam, the first thing we were given as, as art school was this book. And the reason for that is that our instructors told us back then, no matter what you are going to do, uh, no matter which discipline you are going to follow, this will be your reality. And I was, I was reading uh, this book, you know, very intensely. And it had um, chapters such as new technology and the end of jobs. Right, this is what we discussed today about artificial intelligence. It has chapters like electronic money and the casino economy. So everything we just discussed about Bitcoin uh, and so forth. This already, you know, it, for me, this was like, what, electronic money? What are they talking about, you know? But, uh, and, and many other things. So if you, if you manage to get hold of that book, as I said, 24 years old, but super uh, relevant because for me, this has been like a prediction of a time to come. So I was reading it and uh, it was basically the moment when I started to steer away from the aesthetic of the arts and rather into the field of activism, I would say. Uh, and the other defining moment in fact was the late 1990s. Uh, this is also the, the, the time when Supermark started. So basically this, uh, this, this really interesting moment of uh, the financial crisis, the yeah, start of Bitcoin, Occupy Wall Street movement. So this, but also the rise of Airbnb and Uber and basically the, the rise of the platform economy. This, all of this happened around the same time. And uh, also, you know, cloud computing, everything we needed to really establish this digital economy that really took on shape around that time. And this was also the moment when I was lucky enough to stumble in Berlin <clears throat> across a, an abandoned grocery store in Berlin Wedding, which is one of the hopeless quarters where Berliners always wait for when it will become trendy. <laughs> uh, of course, it is, it is trendy now because uh, with the real estate prices, even Wedding became trendy. But back then, 10 years ago, uh, it was really, it was this, this funny moment when the real estate company was almost breaking into tears when me and my partners went there without any capital, any funds, but with a strong will to sort of, um, yeah, regenerate this building into an art and culture hub. Yeah, so we did it, crazy enough, um, no funding, nothing, but uh, we sort of established a um, supermarket into an early co-working space, uh, some sort of experimentation field that opened up a space that hasn't probably has not been there before. A uh, space at the intersection of art and economy and society and digital technology. And uh, very soon people joined us. So we established a little cafe, uh, we ran events there and conferences. So step by step, this abandoned grocery store uh, which we just continued to call supermarket because it was so handy, um, turned, into, um, turned into a strange sort of hub um, that it still is until today uh, and also today, 10 years uh, on, people keep on asking me, so what is supermarket actually doing? Uh, and then I always have a hard time struggling to really explain what it is that we are doing. And then I'm asking myself, is this because I'm so bad in explaining what I'm interested in? Or is it because um, we lack the vocabulary or, you know, maybe we don't have the words or 
we are just not at the point where we as a society manage to really put a label on what it is that we are doing here. I mean, the sphere is also something that might not be accessible for everybody, such as the money lab, such as many of the things we're doing. Why are they relevant? And this is a question that really keeps me going all the time. Because uh, also in Gert's presentation, I think what's really interesting is that when we talk about economy today, we are only talking about a tiny proportion of what the world economy actually is. We constantly leave out, uh, I would say, fundamental factors that keep economies alive, such as invisible labor, care work, reproductive work. So a lot of uh, you know, uh, the, the, the factors that keep our economies going, they, uh, they don't play a role not in our, in our national growth products and all the metrics we have invented, but they also, they also don't make their way into, this, into the discussion. And it's not only these uh, forms of labor which possibly don't, they, they will never have a price tag on them because how much would it cost to uh, look for the people in your community? How much would it cost to make sure that your parents are safe, especially in the time of lockdown? Is there a price tag for that? Is there a price tag for running errands for your neighbor who just don't dare to go outside? Still, it keeps, it keeps the economy going, but we have no means of, uh, of really capturing that and acknowledging that. And I'm not just talking about acknowledging the fact that this is work or being thankful for it, but I'm also really talking about incorporating it into economic models. Um, and I, I think a, a really great example for that is the work of, um, of, of cleaning. Because as a society, we really made it to a point where we consider um, people doing cleaning jobs as, as something that is actually, I mean, this is, this is totally beyond the scope of most of the people because uh, they think this is like a very low uh, work. This is something where you, possibly you never get acknowledgement for. However, without people cleaning hospitals and subway stations and so forth, or bank houses, we would all die, right? Especially in a time of pandemic. So how come that, you know, we have so many blind spots in what actually keeps our economy going? And how come we know so little about economy outside of the very, you know, normative views on what the economy is. So I really think um, one of the main tasks is, um, and this is also what I'm, what I'm trying to do with Supermarkt, this is also what I hope to do with Money Lab and other events, to radically opening up this field of economy. And I'm also very uh, concerned about students and young people who until today, until this very day, uh, <laughs> where we have elections in the US, where we're living in a time of a worldwide pandemic and a multiple crisis. Until today, people continue to get trained in the same old manner. But I really would love to see, uh, you know, you know if, I, if I think about it in a, in, a, in a more tangible way, I have the feeling we really need to open all these windows and open all these doors to get fresh air in and to expand people's minds and understanding and knowledge of what economy actually is. So this is, a, this is groundbreaking work that needs to be done. There are a few people that already started to do the job and I have some of them here in my bookshelf. Let's see. So here, probably David Graeber is a really good example. He passed away recently, really leaving a void another another book i just want to you know another person a woman marilyn waring uh, more than 30 years ago she wrote this book on feminist economics and it's called if women counted nice title of course it has a double meaning what if women counted the work they're doing and don't get paid for but also what if we would manage to really to start um, 
incorporating that, the value of that work into our economic matrices and schemes. So this is one thing, I think this is a real task at hand. This is something that needs to be done. Someone has to do the work of opening up that field, like really turning down this entire discipline upside down and uh, coming up with an entire new notion of how a contributive economy, a commons-based economy, because I think this is something we all agree on basically, what we need today in order to be able to continue as, um, as human beings. But then there's another factor which is just as radical and that, that is not only opening up the, you know, the, the matrices and definitions and value accounting systems, but also opening up the field of economy for those who did not have access to it. This is just equally radical and interesting. And of course, everything we discussed today about electronic money, about digital money, people paying themselves directly, but also, you know, creating banking services for the unbanked, for people that, hadn't, that didn't have any access to financial services so far. Coming up with financial services for these people is, a, is an enormous act of liberating uh, a vast part of the world population from this, uh, from this tyranny, I don't have a better word for it, I'm sorry, uh, of a power imbalance where it's just the super rich defining on who has access to which services or not. And in the end, we don't profit from it anyways. But really opening up services uh, for basically everybody, no matter where people come from, their nationality doesn't play a role, their skin color, their um, gender, nothing. It's just the fact that everybody has to be a contributor to our economy. Um, I think this is also really important to acknowledge. So I would say these are the two things um, I would love to put my focus on. And um, when, we, when I talk about the Money Lab Berlin and what it is that we are going to prepare there, uh, we have landed the title Money Lab Berlin, Disaster Capitalism. Naomi Klein came up with, uh, she, she, she basically came up <clears throat> with, the, with the notion of disaster capitalism. And I think it's really, it's, it's brilliant because if we think about what disaster capitalism actually means, then it's probably, it really describes very good the stage we are currently in. It's, um, it's pointing to the fact that there's always someone who is making a profit from each crisis we are in. And we, we are continuing to find ourselves in crisis after crisis, and this won't stop, right? Talking about and pitying ourselves for those crises that we have managed to also bring to life will, will not serve as well. But um, <clears throat> I think it's rather about understanding who is profiting from that crisis and in whose interest is it that these crises will be ongoing. And um, I, what I, I really think, you know, this whole, this reimagination of what economy can be and that it, that there, that it is possible to really bring a contributive uh, economy into life. This is something I want to showcase at Money Lab Berlin. So that means uh, I want to bring people to different places where people like uh, Eric and Yael uh, who are mainly um, operating from Berlin, um, do their work and to invite people there to show them, look, this is what is already happening. And we, have, we are lucky enough to have some of these spots in Berlin. We are, this is like an emerging playing field for actors in this, in this new economy. And it um, would be lovely to take the audience there let them create their wallets, for instance, for the, um, for the uh, universal basic income on the blockchain project circles. This is a really nice, nice example, <clears throat> which is really aiming at creating access, economic access for basically everybody uh, and uh, building local economies, but also many other projects we see here emerging in the city. I just wanna make it visible want to bring the audience there, allow people to really play with these different forms, to get a taste for it, 
and the ideal goal would be that you know everyone who is taking part in this in this tour is really it, it will be from friday <clears throat> to sunday and if people are going home on sunday that they really have an imagination that there are things emerging and even if they are tiny if even if they are precarious at this point let's just work on making them bigger and more um yeah more viable in the future and i think yeah i could talk so much more but maybe that's already enough really because i'm i'm far more interested also in hearing from you and um yeah just hearing what what brings you here to this session what what would you like to discuss just yeah, opening floor for all sorts of questions. Thank you, Ella. Is there first a round of impressions, comments, questions in the room or online? Yes, Amy. Yeah. Speak loud enough. I will so speak loud enough. No, but yeah. I have a I have a reflection on the on the vocabulary but also and, and on the undefined uh, economy and labor uh, and how the environmental aspects come into that because i keep getting annoyed at uh, the way that some scientists are now trying to put a sum on nature to argue for its right to exist uh, because it becomes vague anyway, because you're using the wrong system to define something that is actually greater, even though I understand the value, then I'm having to prove the worth of a value of a river, providing the water and the water power and the, the, the farmers and, and actually putting money on what, hap what would happen if the river died and people would have to pay for the services it still kind of fits into the old system. So, I mean, I understand completely why they are doing it. And at the same time, I get really frustrated by the fact that they are only valuing the big data systematic outcome of I'm sorry. experience oh. of having a river, but only the money. The loss of money if it dies, uh, which is also and um, they're not. It's also a hidden economy. Yeah. It's really true. The vocabulary. What what kind of vocabulary can we find uh, to recreate the the what we actually live in instead of using the system that we adapt to just to make it understandable to a few. Hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. It's uh, it's it's probably not only the vocabulary, but it's also the mindset. Um, so you know, if I if I think about the way I have been brought up, my education, my societal, you know, uh, about the idea of the commons that a river or a public space or fresh air is like a basic human need and is something that we have to uh, safeguard all together because it's our it's our collective um it's our ground for for living but i i doubt at least i have never been trained on that i completely i have a blind spot i lack the understanding of this as a as a as a as a primary condition for creating a livelihood right and I wonder how it is with uh, everyone else, because we all come from different countries. But I, I think uh, if we are brought up in a system that only works in numbers and currencies, uh, it is, of course, it is very tempting to put a price tag on a river or on a river not functioning, right? <laughs> so, yeah, again, it brings me back to the question of how can we, how can we all do the work uh, to to create a mindset that allows people to immediately understand that this is something, um, a polluted river or what, whatever is something we need to take care of together. And it's not about paying, paying the price for it primarily, but thinking of ways how to stand up for it and, um, and safeguarding it.
I want to do uh, yes. Yael, Yael and then Stephen. I wanted to ask something or like to, to say something that I think relates to you, what you were uh, pointing at, Ella, is uh, also something that Gert uh, brought up, which I think is really, was really interesting and significant for us in the sphere, I think is the role of uh, designers and artists in visualizing these financial flows and making that accessible and, and like kind of mapping out the and basically opening up the imagination by doing that, by allowing this uh, transparency, which doesn't exist. I think it's very tricky because uh, I think it's very difficult to visualize things which are by nature uh, opaque and are uh, insistent on being opaque. And, you know, this is part of their uh, initial characteristic. But I think that what you're talking about, this vocabulary that we need to develop or to see the things that are unseen, uh, it's actually, I, I feel like that can be a really important uh, aim of the sphere even, you know, like if we're looking at a very specific ecosystem of, for example, the, the performing arts or the arts and, and kind of at least being able to map out and to expose that and then by that educating the community and and I think the, the, it's necessarily going to expand beyond the, the ecosystem of the arts. I mean, it's, it's because the arts is just it's in, embedded into a larger financial um, spectrum. So uh, I think it's, it's connected to, to what you're saying. This, um, and I just wanted to point that out, that I really feel that this like, design of the interface, the aesthetics of how do we visualize that is, uh, seems to me like super, super central and by that I, I also have to say that I am kind of uh, I have also the concern that you know like user interface is in itself already um, is, a, is a determinant uh, it de determines how we perceive something so I think it's also tricky how do we create a user interface which is somehow participate or is, is developed in a, in a collaborative way or in an open way that uh, it's not top-down design but it's bottom-up design even in the visualization of the, of the, the whole thing. Uh, so I think this is like maybe the, the, the challenge that we might be facing by trying to visualize that. But I think this connects somehow to both what you said Ella and also what Gert said before. Yeah, thanks for that, Yael. If you look at the current discussion around artificial intelligence, there's this uh, growing criticism um, against uh, the engineers that train and, and design those uh, artificial intelligence systems. And these are mainly uh, people from the Western Hemisphere, most of them male, rather young. So what and of course, you, you, see, you see the outcome at, in the product. And I, I, I think this can even become dangerous. So if we don't manage to inscribe by design uh, diversity into the products we are using, we are really, um, I, I think we are creating enormous problems for ourselves. Yeah, I, th I think it's really, it's true what you're saying. Good point, yeah. Um, yeah, do you want me to go ahead? Please. Yeah, um, I think some of the, the black box problem is, is also our, our inability or our, our lack of praxis of looking at our own frame, the frames that we operate within, and looking at our own vocabularies as agents within those frames, and the difficulty we have of transcending the frame that we're, by default, uh, find ourselves in. Mm -hmm. and, and in doing so, we become sort of involuntary agents um, in, in things that we, we don't support. But because we don't have the other vocabularies and we don't, the, the concept of the tragedy of the commons, for example, which is a super simple concept, it's surprising me how many people don't know about it. And, and if they don't know about that, to, to refer that as a vocabulary to discourse becomes impossible, which makes the discourse impossible, which means we've already lost the what we're discussing is already lost uh, at the beginning of the discussion 
because it's not possible because we are ourselves operating within this black box. Um, and, and how we do that or how we, how we alleviate that process, I think is just by really continuously questioning um, the origins of the vocabularies we use and how they connect or how they might be derivatives of frames that we haven't become aware enough to, tr to transcend. Um, and I think uh, being sort of multinational in my context, I'm, I'm const constantly aware of falling into frameworks and, and not being able to, to get out of them. Um, and it's very difficult also intellectually, even at the university level, because we are rewarded by being experts within our frameworks, by knowing every single aspect of a framework, but not by deconstructing it, not by leaving it. So mm. there, there is this, it, it starts with us as well. And, and I mm. think a really big problem that we're, we're dealing with. Even, even earlier, we were talking about um, the distribution of IP value. Now, if you look at it from that perspective, even that it is in itself a, a zero sum game. Mm -hmm. um, if we look at the capacity of the sphere, it might be of generating value that otherwise wouldn't be generated by using IP as a vehicle rather than a zero sum distribution uh, problem. Um, but anyways, I, yeah, I guess, I, I, I guess I'll stop rambling, but <laughs> these are my reflections, so thank you. Yeah, great point, please. Hey, yeah, my name is Elisa. Hi. <clears throat> yeah, I also has, I always like reflecting on what you brought up, like the IP work and what you propose, like, yes, and, uh, and, and critics, or like, I'm the <clears throat> critical voice in it. Um, and then it made me think of also like the efficiency or like what's the, and thinking like, okay, this is like the way of putting it into uh, putting a price tag on it. So, uh, as, um, Talks about also like the, yeah, like the risk um, uh, effect or like uh, it's an efficient way to communicate somehow. With, and as you were talking Ella, about like what's the reality that we know about, we are not maybe, <clears throat> we don't have like a, they, we don't go and, and look at small rivers on a daily basis and have this physical experience of like the nature in that sense. So we have another uh, stronger experience of life instead. Um, and it makes me think, so what you're talking about makes me think also about this, like how to, so how is it that we manage to be, stay in a process till it's very, just this the critical, the critique, the criticality uh, is very close to, and it can really tip on to policing also uh, the efforts uh, that we are trying to make. I mean, from ourselves, also like the self critical self policing and then like staying in a process it's like, uh, like how yeah so it's also talks about efficiency I imagine I'm really not I'm, if I'm talking very understandably but I'm I, it's I'm thinking about it so so then um, and also talking about the efficiency like that we have to also be efficient in trying to keep alive the board uh, and then like uh, and, and making the change um, change possible and then there then there like this this uh, succeeding in in keeping a process, like we staying in a process is, is very important for that to happen. Did that make any mm. sense? Yeah. Mm. yeah, thank you so much for sharing sharing your reflection. I, I think, yeah, you know, also what, what, what Stephen was saying about, you know, what you, what you're both saying is, is about the complexity of uh, liberating ourselves from a very rigid belief system that we are part of or a framing, right? And I just want to give a, an example. And I would love to hear examples from your own life. Um, you know, I was, I was grown up, uh, I, I grew up in a tiny village in the south of Germany, super small, um, and uh, really poor people, majority were farmers. Um, and we had a lot of um, collective facilities. So for instance, we had a, a collective uh, apple yards. We had a collective baking house where every Saturday the women went there with the kids and they baked their bread and uh, you know they came with their dough, baked their bread. So every Saturday was baking day. 
we had huge collective uh, um, uh, cooling houses because these were farmers, right? So they needed a facility to store. So we had a milk house, <laughs> all these facilities. And then, you know, what is really interesting, and I, I, I keep on thinking about that, that my mother at some point, um, that she looked at this infrastructure and it's not only her, but also others. And they had the feeling that this is somewhat primitive. And then, you know, step by step, people sold their land and all these facilities, they disappeared. And my mother went to work in a factory instead. And so did the others. So they gave up on this freedom and, you know, everything we would maybe also romanticize a little bit from today's perspective, but they gave up on that. And because they wanted to have money, because they wanted to buy stuff. This narrative of, you know, this, this whole futuristic idea that we, we have been uh, working and living towards the promise of yeah, stability and consumerism. And this was super strong in the time when I grew up. And this was overwhelming. And this was the framing I, I really inherited, right? So if I think about that, sometimes I can't believe, if I look at friends of mine who, um, who are trying to build uh, intentional communities outside of Berlin, and they try to build exactly what I had as a child and what everyone thought was primitive. <laughs> and all this happened, you know, in, yeah, in, a, in a lifetime. And, and I, hope there's, I hope there's much more in store for me, but this is like, this is the last 40 years. So... And then I really understand why it is so difficult to liberate myself from these framings. Yeah, and maybe you have examples for that as well, because I think it's, um, it's just really interesting to, to think of our own stories and where it actually starts with us. One question. Mm. I'm looking at Eric and Ola and Sara. Do we have do we have enough anthropologists and sociologists in the sphere? Because it would be so nice to have somebody also following us. Mm -hmm. I mean, from a bigger perspective, because the industrialism and the dream of freedom. And I mean, it's not that long ago that politicians were talking, at least in Sweden, in the 30s and 40s about the future where people would only have to work four hours a day and be free the rest of the time. And that was part of the political dream uh, uh, before new public management and lots of other things came in. But it would also be really nice to not, uh, to not, lose, uh, to not lose the history of, of, uh, of knowledge and observation of, of humans mm just because we are really rushed ourselves and project-based and speeding and, and living in a time of, of self-imposed deadlines and efficientness. Uh, it would be very interesting to see uh, if we can break our own frames because we are the people we are with the privilege we have, otherwise we wouldn't have the time to sit here. Uh, so, uh, the, the framework breaking, and especially for you who are teachers and pedagogues, it would be even more interesting. Since I think you're right, it has to come back to school. We have to we teach kids in a system built in the 1800s of discipline that people complain about breaking down because society is not the same. So it would be really nice to have some more pedagogues and anthropologists in our in our team. Yeah, I think, you know, also what, what David Graeber was doing with his research, he's a, he, he is also an anthropologist uh, in economics, right? I think, like in this book, for example, The, the, the Debt, um, I think he makes it really clear uh, what the an anthropologist um, position is in, in, the, in the discipline of economy. And I, I really agree. I think it's, uh, it's, it's really interesting to, to have... These, pushes, the, the, these positions in the team as well. There's a function within the sphere, at least something that we would like to activate uh, that we call peer-to-peer -peer ethnography. 
So to decentralize or distribute the function of the observing uh, within. So that's something to work on uh, in the next couple of months. But basically the idea is that uh, we are all part of an ecology or complex ecology, a network in which every person, every node in the network has a particular perspective on what's going on. And uh, to try to encourage uh, to the sharing of the perspectives so that something of a collective intelligence that is differential emerges out of the initiative. Because one thing I can say from uh, the sphere perspective or the perspective that I am in the sphere is that um, there's a lot of learning or co-learning happening. Like it's, it's we gathered people from different uh, horizons and um, we talked about like organizing and, and for me for me the word organizing is more of a question mark than um, than a, a, an answer is what does it mean to organize it's like a constant process and for me uh, my little experience in, in in forming collectives is that a collective is alive as long as it learns from the parts the constituents that are part of it so um, organizing for me uh, maybe ideally speaking, is uh, to constantly create occasions for co-learning so that the learning process is the organizational force itself. And then, yeah, so, so that's, that's one aspect. And then that being said, um, I guess I would channel a little bit of uh, Geert's uh, presentation when he was dramatizing the birth of the new, like how do we bring novelty into existence? And that, that type of uh, politics of contraction, like how do we bring ourselves to break through the wall or the, the frames of cliches and, and actually bring ourselves into, into novelty, which is um, harder than it seems, I guess, or, or is almost a paradoxical task because we can say that we want to break the frame and yet be still reinforcing the frame by saying that we want to break the frame. So there's this moment where I like to think of um, the sphere as uh, an organism that speaks through gestures. So, like, so tapping in the idea that we're working with circus artists and performing artists, and that for me a, a real danger uh, is to uh, draw into words, like to draw under discourses, critical discourses, enlightened discourses, but still discourses, and how to bring ourselves into, um, into occasions where the gesture speaks for themselves. So that, that's one wish that I have for the sphere, that we tap in the radicality of what circus can bring to the table and, and make space for the gestures to speak for themselves. That is maybe my... my um, I don't think it's anthropological, maybe it's uh, <laughs> philosophical, but like how to keep discourse in check so that something else can speak and, and then from the people from outside, when they think about the sphere, uh, they, they can say, okay, yeah, there's a process going on, but there's, there's this gesture, there's this action that breaks the mold and, and allow for something to happen. That, that is, uh, I guess, uh, one of my deepest wish for, for our collective endeavor. Mm -hmm. But then it also becomes a power question because there's also the informal statuses both in the art field and uh, in everything somehow or, or spoken of power structures or hierarchies but also whether the circus would be very low on the artistic hierarchy of different art forms due to historical reasons and being the traveling non-status freedom uh, romanticized poverty or whatever it is well, all the art forms have different hierarchies, but all the art forms have also different hierarchies in all the countries, depending on their history. I know some about the Baltics and the Nordics after having years of discussions in those and finding out finally the hierarchies within those countries. But every country also have their own hierarchies in the art, but then the academic hierarchies and the word hierarchies and the numbers hierarchies uh, because in that case, we have to give up power to people. And it's really hard to give up power even if we think we want to. So it's going to be an interesting uh, concept of having to step aside to give your given space to somebody else that has another knowledge and expression. 
So even if we talk about it and we want to, it's an interesting practice to step aside because it is scary. So that's the trust. That's the trust of something bigger than yourself and the bigger of your status and society turning everybody into freelancers and fighters for positions because that's, at least in the West, I would say what's happened in the last 40 years of the system becoming less shorter employment, uh, industries changing, like all the fear in the world bringing on the nationalism in all these countries fighting for some kind of stable is connected to the fear of, of others and, and loss of safety. And that's why everybody can, I think, just pull the safety card and then you have a Trump or an Orban or a Brexit or anything. You are under threat, save yourself. Uh, so, so there's a lot of trust, but also a lot of hierarchies, also in this room and in the sphere and in everything that we should just not forget. Mm -hmm. It's hard, but it can be fun. Things happen when one gets a power. It's really scary, but it's kind of fun. Mm. I think games are a good way to uh, redistribute power because we test it at least. Yeah, testing, but also like yeah. no, not games as you know the playful ones only, but also economic games where mm. you know. What participation in one aspect of the game, you know, kind of like an illusionist, you know, showing you uh, this side can pull a trick on the other uh, while you're paying attention to something else. So it kind of removes this friction of giving up power voluntarily, sort of, you know, like uh, as a ritual uh, that has that element in the center, but you know, makes the whole experience maybe a little bit smoother, a little bit more granular. Maybe we could reward people for giving up power. Definitely. <laughs> no, but it would be fun because then it would be a state to give up power. I mean, I think actually people are so, we are so egoistical in our core somehow, as we are, that it may be the reward would be giving, I mean, otherwise people wouldn't give to charities and put stamps on things and build houses and maybe we should just reward people for stepping aside Definitely. and enlarge diversity or like tokens, like play with I gave this up. I was offered this job, I gave it to somebody else. I was offered this, I gave it to somebody else. I don't know. But so we have the context of um, like the recent uprisings, I mean, because this actually has happened a couple of times, like a few big leaders of yeah. companies yeah. Uh, actually stepped aside to give way to uh, more diversity. Which gave them more cred and credibility, which yeah. is actually a reward. Yeah, no, this, yeah, why not? Why not? Yeah, but one, one, one aspect also on the, uh, of, of this uh, very project and on the uh, off-chain part of this very project and actually as a part of the Creative Europe project <coughs> that, that we are also, we have, we have this idea of, of uh, at least starting with, with uh, working uh, through the Holacracy protocol, which we have not started now, but I would say like the Holacracy protocol is interesting because it is a way of organizing uh, uh, organically. It is a very, uh, of course, it has a strict framework and the framework will, will uh, uh, manage the social in different ways, but it, it does distribute power and also empowers uh, each, each uh, individual to, to act on uh, what uh, that role uh, is uh, realizing is necessary to do and and then there's different uh, the, the governance meeting and the tactical meetings that are uh, keeping the the organization uh, uh, organic i mean this is just one one framework but it's a it's a starting point where we uh, that is basically uh, rewarding uh, distribution of power uh, because it's what is the purpose of what we're doing? And if, if we as uh, if we divide uh, the idea of dividing role and soul uh, a bit, and if we if we are seeing that the role is to fulfill, going towards what what is the where we want to go, then that's that goes before. Uh, it's not. It's like the, the purpose driven rather than the than the profit driven kind of uh, organization. Uh, 
I think I mean this is this this would be an experiment, but for for the sphere we have talked about starting from this protocol and we have dived into it, but we have not formalized because we still we're still formalizing who are we here and where to begin. It's basically just to begin and then and then uh, take it from there. But it's it's uh, it's a matter of, of time right now to, that we have not established it this fall because we got the, the the knowledge about this new project very late. So we're we're ready now to start the first labs and just we want to, to go for it but we at the moment it's very uh, happening very haphazardly in one way but still we're, we're organizing uh, like this uh, but i mean the, the, your perspective is so so important i think but uh, we should play with that and, um, another way of an, another totally different way that i just uh, that I get reminded of all the time because I, I loved it. It's, it's just a quote, and it's from from uh, Roberto Mangabeira Unger. Uh, um, uh, it's a Harvard professor. He was the minister of strategy in, in Brazil, also, and he he has this in in the left alternative. The book he's writing like it was never about the the. Um, uh, humanization of of society. It was about the divinization of humanity. And that's for me. I, I mean, it's, it's like we can think about it in different ways, but for me, it really shift changes the uh, the direction uh, from from a burden to a possibility somehow. And he's uh, just thinking about breaking frameworks and so on. It really helps me to be empowered to distribute uh, to let go of. We're doing this for another reason. Uh, my personal. Uh, Purpose, or I don't know, <laughs> yeah, but it's super difficult to to, to come to make a project that is perfectly uh, perfectly perfect. <laughs> Somehow, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, my two cents. Um, if I could jump in, um, it's there's another way. I know I'm I'm a I, I'm constantly being accused of, and rightfully so, of being a naive optimist. It, and it sends me into trajectories that I shouldn't really do, uh, which is good, but painful, but still usually worth the pain. Uh, anyway, so one way of looking at power is looking at it in terms of value. So power follows value. It also creates it, but it kind of herds it. Um, if we look at look at culture as a generative force it's that's where the value is created so the value the creation of value is in itself an act of power um and and i think that's that's an important aspect all right I'll, let me take it again am i still here or did, did i completely freeze no no no, no. sorry what i understood but I don't know about the, what happened with the others. Well, the others were frozen, so I assume that I was frozen for them. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. So, uh, be naive and looking at power. One could look at it as the culture generates uh, value. Uh, value generates power. So power just comes out of value. If there's no value, there's no power. So looking at it from that way and generating value, then power follows suit. Power, just by being very aware of how we generate value through, through the sphere. And this is part of the game process, is to constantly generate value that is void of a structure, that's outside of a structure, that won't claim it immediately. Um, and this is really, this is kind of a weird way of stepping into sort of a fog. Um, but I, but I, think it's, I think it's a really interesting way of looking at it, or at least it's an <laughs> optimistically naive way of looking at it. And, and I think the arts do this and have done this through time. It's just, it's been a constant battle of being re-hurdled or herded like cattle uh, through power mechanisms uh, and framed through power. Mm. Uh, which is why if you if you ever go to Basel art, it's a shocking thing to see um, art bought and sold like vegetables. It's uh, it's really, you know, if you haven't done it, prepare yourself before you do. I was I was shocked to the core. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, thanks.
I uh, can I say something? I just um, I wanted to say something before, after what Sarah was. Uh, it's, sorry that I'm a little bit backtracking, just because I didn't find a moment to say before. But um, Sarah, what you were suggesting about the that we need like anthropo anthropologists in in the process of the sphere. <laughs> Oh, sorry, Amy. Sorry, I didn't. I cannot see who's who's speaking. But um, I think I was talking to Eric about this. I think one of the challenges in designing the process of uh, building the sphere is um, is this idea that that a lot of processes are happening simultaneously. So, like, there is the game design, there is the IP management, there is the um, the peer-to-peer -peer ethnology and ethnography, sorry. And there's, um, so there's all of these processes that are kind of happening simultaneously where I feel that um, in fact, we might need before we jump into design uh, and developing uh, the technological infrastructure and all of these things, just from my understanding, I feel that we kind of need to stay a little bit, like to delay a little bit that moment, those moments, and stay within the framework of mapping and understanding what are we looking at, what are what are what are these value flows that are that we are even discussing right now, and uh, and I think that once we've managed to definitely not, I mean, there's no way to um, exhaust that process of of mapping. Thing. But I think that maybe we can reach a certain moment where at least I think all of the members of this uh, that are engaged in this process are somehow on the same on the same uh, platform or the same uh, like aligned in some way. Uh, I think that would make the work of everybody in the project a little bit easier and uh, and also be more synchronized in this kind of purpose that you were talking about, like what is the purpose of what we're building here and um, and I think this is difficult at the moment to uh, define because we haven't really done collectively this mapping and um, so I just wanted to say that I know that we jumped already uh, way, way forward uh, in the discussion, but I just felt that this is, uh, this is an important aspect of the stage that we are in at the moment. Like, um, and, and because like, how can you design a game when you don't know still what are the, who are the players and, and what, is, what is being played? What is, you know, and um, yeah, that's, that's, just, and I think that this point about Amy's point about having um, having these people in our team is actually like um, yeah it might be like central at this point. Oh. I uh, yeah thank you for that. I really uh, you know this this resonates a lot. Uh, this this idea of um, of of really you know getting trained in in mapping. Um, and taking the time to uh, acknowledge what we are surrounded by and what is, because it's also something I feel, especially if I if I look back um, in my in my own life, uh, I have constantly I have always been looking uh, what's what's in front of me because this entire notion of progress is something that that puts us in a flight mode all the time. And it, it, uh, it's this carrot, you know, that's, uh, that you see in front of your nose. So you always, wanna, you always wanna go to a point beyond where you actually are. So uh, this, this practice of understanding the present moment and the value of, of the present moment, the capacity, the, the chances you are surrounded with, is something that uh, at least I see is, is is not, is not not existing in my life you know it's as if this wouldn't be around as um yeah as a as a practice as um yeah how to say as a as an intellectual capacity even because uh you know if 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 we would be better at that because then maybe we would sometimes slow down a process or we would maybe also decide to just stay where we are at <laughs> Because uh, it's not always the answer to move on and to, to try to explore this, this point in the future uh, where there's always the promise that things are getting better, uh, but it's not always the case. <laughs>